So welcome to the uh, session, which will be a bit different than the rest of the sessions we had up so far. I was um, yes. thinking we're going to kill you with PowerPoint. And Milikom, <laughs> before I came to the company, I can tell you, was very good in producing a lot of PowerPoint presentations. So it's a desk by PowerPoint. So the idea is ra rather to do, uh, after lunch as well, <coughs> a little lighter session for you talking about the digital lifestyle, which, as you know, is a kind of key aspect for me, at least, when it comes to our strategy going forward. Because whatever happens to all the margins, whatever happens to all the other things, if we succeed in the ambition of uh, becoming this integrated digital lifestyle player, I think then the uh, strategy will work. And we want to do a bit more interactive. So we want to discuss it with some people who are um, not executives, like uh, Martin Weiss who's sitting there, but who are on the day-to-day -day business when it comes to our, our products, or when it comes to questions like bundling, or how do you package and market those kind of products. Um, and it should be give you as well the opportunity to ask uh, questions in between. So anytime you feel you want to add something, you want to say something, you want to challenge something, raise your hand. There are um, microphones all over the place, and uh, you can answer. And as I said, those are people, except for Martin Weiss, you don't see that often probably when it comes to Capital Markets Day, but they do the hard work in the, uh, in the background of uh, the offices in Miami, London, and uh, wherever. And maybe I just briefly introduce them so you get to um, understand who they are. On the left here is uh, Victor Unda, who has been uh, the kind of chief commercial officer for us now for a while. And Victor will be really instrumental for us when it comes to how do we bundle the products. You know, there's always a question about is bundling really value creative? creative? Victor will do this. He will do this in terms of uh, how you bundle data packages and voice packages. But even beyond that, how do we integrate our music services, our sports services, and so forth, and so forth. How do we combine the mobile and uh, the fixed and the cable, and how do we integrate all this together? Victor has been with the company for, for many, many years. He has been GM of our most successful business uh, in, uh, at that time, at least, in Guatemala. And it's still a very good business, to be fair, even <laughs> after he left. So uh, he is an old veteran. Martin joined the company with me um, in uh, two years ago. Before that, he has been uh, probably one of the best consultants I have seen when it comes to the cable, telecom, and media sector in, uh, in Europe. The fact that he joined us, I think, is, uh, gives us credit as a company that we can attract people to give up their own very profitable business and join a very profitable business as well, but it's not their own business, unfortunately, anymore. Uh, and Martin really sits on the kind of nerve center when it comes to the kind of new developments, what are we doing in the future, and uh, what is the kind of tools we need in order to integrate the digital lifestyle uh, prospect. The next thing we have Luciana, who joined more or less the same time like I did, the company. And when I did my first round trip in Latin America, she came with me right away. So um, she got the kind of uh, crash course when it comes to marketing and branding, because she takes care of our brand and the, the marketing side. Which is, and we're going to talk about this as well, which is a very tricky point. Because you have to understand, in the old days, we communicate to the consumer, handset, price, network, done. Easy. Buy it. Nowadays, we have to communicate handset, price, network, music, sports, FIFA app, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And uh, for me, coming with a kind of marketing background as well, or a favor, favor when it comes to marketing, it's will be very complicated. How do you bundle and package those things together? How do you communicate to the consumer at the very end? This is a very attractive, a simple offer, and uh, you have to, to do it. And then last uh, but not least, we have another David Gilarans, who has been joining the company in 2011. Before that, he has been a kind of serial entrepreneur, founding companies and uh, making them successful. Very pleased to have him here. He is a kind of brain when it comes to the Tigo Music concept, for example. He has been the brain when it comes to the, in our view, very innovative Facebook integration. He sits on a lot of other new projects, which you can talk about as well. But this is a kind of group which more or less is a nerve system when it comes to the, um, the digital lifestyle situation. And maybe we, we come back to uh, what our friend from Nordea was asking. Uh, let's go straight into to, to the point. Uh, and we make it very concrete in, in the first place. Let's talk about bonding. Let's talk about the product, Tiger Music. The question I think he raised is, which is a very fair question, why? I mean, there have been so many music services in the telecom industry, and they all failed. And when I was sitting on the other side of the media <laughs> business, I was always laughing about the telecom guys trying to do entertainment. Why on earth should we be better than, than other ones? <clears throat> and I want to clarify that I was also on the other side of the, uh, you know, the table during those days. Um, really, what we did is we, uh, and as we mentioned throughout the day, um, we've been focusing on a specific target group, and that is either 
early adopters of smartphones or soon to be adapters uh, of smartphones. So what we were trying to do is find a service, a compelling service that will get those users to prefer Teagle when it came to selecting their, their provider of uh, soon to be digital lifestyle. So um, we analyze the market, we uh, analyze our consumers, uh, we try to understand what they did and what their expectations were uh, as soon as they had a smartphones in their hand and music uh, you know, came uh, flashing uh, in, in every single study we did. Then we analyzed what our competitors were doing and it was very clear for us that um, they were not really going beyond promoting a concert or you know, associating their name to a specific artist, but it, when it came to creating an experience, uh, nobody was creating an experience for consumers. So um, as we mentioned, we started with Latin America. We learned a lot in Latin America. We learned a lot uh, from markets like Colombia and, and Guatemala. And what we saw was, you know, first understanding the consumers check, then who should we partner to, uh, with to develop um, uh, the vertical, the music vertical. And believe me, we uh, analyze, uh, should we build our own? Should we partner with a third, third party? Uh, should we partner with a third party? Who wants to work with us, right? And that's when you know, we started talking about also becoming a friendly member of the ecosystem, um, where uh, the companies we partner with are companies that we may cooperate with them or, or not, but at the end of the day, you know, we're extracting value from the consumer in the process. So, so we set up on Deezer, um, which was our first music partner, also our partner for, for Africa. But, um, what we clearly understood is that local content was the key to delivering the right experience. Um, Deezer, and at the time, I think also Spotify, they had like 20 million songs, right? But uh, let's say I'm Venezuelan, and I get one of the services, and I look for Waco, which is my, my preferred band, and they're not there, and I'm gonna think the service sucks. So it was very important for us to ensure that we had the right content loaded into Deezer so we could create the right experience and meet the consumer's expectations. So that was the first part. <clears throat> the other part was, as much as people want music, right, willingness to pay. And willingness to pay, we're talking two and a half, three years ago, was extremely low. Uh, and I, I even think in some of the development markets, piracy is an issue. So when we're looking at you know, how to present this, we said, okay, we can go out and offer it for $7.99 uh, dollars or whatever, $6.99, which we did. We, we went out and offered the standalone service at that price, but we made sure that it was actually bundled in the data plans that made sense. So if our consumers on average were buying you know, $10 uh, a month data plans to give whatever an example, right? We made sure that it was kind of like bundled on the $16 plan was double the capacity so that our consumers will move to our higher uh, data plans and with that ensure that we're moving the ARPU of our consumers. So um, that, was, that was another very important thing. And the other important thing um, for us was, um, again, uh, content curation. So uh, uh, for those that have probably used some of the services, um, you know, finding the right songs and then creating a playlist that makes sense for your Friday party or whatever it may be, is also an issue. So we also saw an opportunity to curate content in a way, not only that we had the local content, of course, also the other 30 million songs that we have today, but also the playlists at the moment that matters for consumers were there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I guess that's that's uh, more or less how, how we did it, of course. Uh, I don't know um, yeah, if you want to mention what we did in terms of how we brought it to market and the brand. I think, you know, picking on this point of creating the playlist and stuff, I think music <laughs> offers a unique connection with consumers, right? But it's not about only what, about what we offer, but how and how easy it is for consumers to use. Because they are less exposed in the markets where we are present, they are less exposed to these services than in the U.S. or in Europe. You know, so we are the ones bringing it to them, bringing it to them in an in a easy way, teaching them, educating them even in the stores how to use these products and creating this emotional connection because we do have the social networks with these people so we can create these lists and, you know, and animate this conversation with the consumers. So I think this is part of the 360 degree delivery of these products that's beyond you know, simply having the product in the market uh, available. And if I may add, we also part of the success is the innovations that we have. Obviously, 
the, the whole industry was geared towards the more developed markets where you have you know, monthly subscriptions because the, the way these markets have structures are mainly postpaid subscribers. In our markets, it's quite the opposite. We have mainly prepaid markets. So part of the challenge we've been facing to get this, to continue penetrating our subscriber base was actually to teach the music industry that the monthly subscription is not really the way to penetrate these, let's say, uh, underdeveloped uh, markets where we, where we operate. And as we have engaged in these conversations, and as we have been able to get them to understand how to reprice the products on different uh, offer designs, we've been able now to be sending to prepaid subscribers who are buying access to the services on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, depending on their disposable income because affordability is a key driver of adoption in our markets. So that is also one of the things we bring to, to really enhance the experience of the consumer, making it in such a manner that they can actually buy it, not only see it, but they can actually buy into it. Let me, let me come into this one, because I think that's an important point we should, uh, we should share with this one as well. If we, we say the product is good, we come with a kind of different approach. We have the local content. We have artists like Juanes, uh, for example, in, in Colombia. And, uh, we, we differentiate ourselves as the music brand, not just as a music service, as the music brand in, uh, in a country. The question still remains, I guess, when it comes to, to Victor, and, and for me, when I talk to Victor on a daily basis as well, how do we create value out of this for us in the, in the, uh, in the bundling world? Because when you talk to colleagues in the industry, when you talk to colleagues in Europe, there's a big belief for many CEOs that bundling is uh, value destructive. Because bundle one, two, three things together just means a discount. So is this really the kind of trend we're going to see in Latin America as well? Or why should we be different, which we believe, of course, we're yeah. going to be different. Why should we be different in the bundling approach compared to Europe or US? And two sides to the bundling. Obviously, we were discussing product bundling. And as David mentioned in, in his intervention, obviously, what we're looking is to enhance you know, the, the, the spend of the consumer with the subscription that we're doing with products like music. Um, on the other hand, we also have the cross-business verticals bundling. We, you know, in more developed markets, you see mature markets in terms of, and, and um, Martin explained this this morning, where you have highly penetrated markets in terms of fixed services. That is not the case in our markets. So what we do with bundling between the business units is actually using that bundle to shift the conversation from price to value. So what we do is where we have network areas where we have underpenetrated home passes that we have we bundled mobile services with the home services to actually shift the discussion of price and actually command a premium on the home services by combining it with uh, the mobile product. So we might take uh, you know, a small hit, if you will, you know, two, three dollars off what they're spending on mobile, but then we get incremental revenues of about, if I use a precise example, $30 incremental ARPU of a house that wasn't connected because they were getting the, the service from a third party who was completely exclusively on price with similar content to ours. Not the same, but pretty close, but at a much lower price point. So we shift the discussion, and we're being very successful in that respect. And probably the most relevant point is not only do we get the subscriber on board, but the impact this has on the business. So if we go back to the, to the product bonding, what we've seen with music is an ARPU increase on average of about 25%. <laughs> On a monthly basis, and we see churn reducing by almost two thirds when compared to the normal subscriber. And the same applies when we do the, the home and mobile business bundling. We see a significant reduction in churn of about 40% less churn of mobile users who have actually bundled their home services with their, with their, um, with their mobile services. Martin, you have been uh, <coughs> seeing it all, I guess, in, in the last 20 years, but again, on the European telco media side. From your benchmark view as well, and your experience with, with other telcos, what, what do you think is the, the USP we have versus those ones? And maybe as a follow-up question as well, does the same model work in Africa? Now, I think Victor touched on something really important, and that is um, we need to be relevant to the consumer. The bundling is not about um, you know, sort of creating superior economics in markets where you could get the single product from you know, 15 different sources, you now to, you know, you now capture it to create superior economics on the supply side. That's not what this is about. What this is about is actually bringing products to consumers in developing markets who are getting it for the first time. It's the first time they're getting a smartphone. It's the first time they're getting broadband to their home. It's the first time they get a subscription music product. And the bundling, the product bundling, is around creating a seamless consumer experience 
And this is why for us bundling as a supplier works because it's really something that's beneficial to the consumer. What we've seen in Western Europe, a lot of the bundling has actually destroyed value because it was just the discounting game trying to drive down churn levels and then make it work that way. For us, it's about creating value to the consumer and that's something that's really working. And what about Africa? Now, in, 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 in Africa, um, I think Arthur alluded to that, Africa and Latin America are different stages in the development. Um, on the, on the multi-product bundling, of course, in Africa, we, we don't have fixed land in Africa. We don't have a DTH service in Africa. And the, for us, it is more about creating African solutions to African problems. Um, music will play a big role in that. Um, there is no question about it. But again, if you look at the development cycle, in Africa, smartphone penetration in the markets where we are at um, is below 5%, while in some of our Latin markets, it's already at 20 25%. So we're at a very early stage in the development cycle, but markets are going to go there. 10 years from now, it's going to be smartphone markets. Five years from now, in Africa, two-thirds of the phones are going to be smartphones that will be sold new to the market. And there, the bundling is absolutely essential. So yes, we will go down that route as well. Luciana, on the, um, as I said at the beginning, the, um, the crucial part is do we overstretch the customer's intake? Do we, do we do too much what the customer can absorb in terms of products we're offering, in terms of complexity in the future? And, and how do you challenge all those kind of different brands, I think, which is important here for people to understand as well, yet keep the message to the end consumer very simple? Mm -hmm. And maybe talk about the first results we see with say, Tivo Smart and, and the kind of new brands we're getting in. Yeah. I think you know what, what we have done in terms of the strategy for the brand is if you want to be more than telco, we need to actually show to consumers you're more than telco. So by you know finding a brand identity to the different businesses we have, we are doing that. So it's transparent to consumers that we have more products than telco. Then I think the second thing we have done is to, to use these icons that you might have seen over like the hexagonal icons, you know to help communicate what types of products are included you know, in this particular offer you're giving to the consumers because it's a way to facilitate navigation. And it's a way that we use in the advertising, it's a way using the smartphones as a common language you know, you're creating to these consumers to facilitate their navigation. Again, there's a lot about education of consumers in this new world. They, they're not as nearly exposed to these products in our markets as we are in the US or in Europe. So that's, that's one part of it. I think the other part of it, we have been carefully creating these brands and monitoring. Because one question I get, which is a very fair one, is are these, brandings, are these brands adding or diluting the overarching Tigo brand, right? And um, so what we have done is we have placed, you know, and have launched the brands, and then we measure actually the perception of consumers that um, are exposed to this new brand and understand it. And the perception they have of Tigo versus the ones that are not, you know, exposed to this new brand. And what we have seen is a significant increase in the perception of consumers about Tigo when they are exposed to the other brands. So they think Tigo is more innovative. They think Tigo is, you know, have, have solutions to their lives. Uh, they think uh, Tigo, you know, owns music significantly at statistically significant higher levels versus the people that have not, not been exposed to these brands. So we have been very careful to one, make things simple and consistent across the brands to help navigation, but two, measuring and really understanding step by step to make sure we have it right. Again, if there are any questions coming, well, otherwise we move on maybe to the OTT side, because when I, I spoke- I would, I would probably only add for the, uh, something that Luciana said is that We've also find, find, found our relationship between owning attributes like music um, with, okay, so Tigo has the best internet network or the best attribute to go with my phone to, to navigate the internet and also has the best applications to enjoy my smartphone. So, so we're constantly looking at which are the attributes that matter for consumers, again, when they're making that decision to jump into uh, a smartphone um, in the case of Tigo, and how do we measure those attributes back into our results? And, and as we discussed earlier, we're clearly winning uh, in that space in our markets. We are winning more smartphone users than our, our competitors and in the region. If, if I can just provide that data point on that is, 
we have seen that people that are aware of these brands, they are 20% more likely to purchase. So the purchasing intent increasing up to 20%, which is pretty significant. And recommendation of the brand increases up to 50%. It's a real big number. So obviously this uh, then, uh, and, and, and the, I think the other aspect of it is we tend to win better with the <coughs> digital consumer and if you remember the, the chart that Mario showed in the beginning, showing that you're growing twice as fast with the digital consumer versus competition, I mean, just, just brands are helping in, in this sense. And just people have like an ARPU that might be three times the average of the, the ARPU of the market. Somebody asked me in the break, um, how do we compete in the future towards the big OTT players? Because music <laughs> maybe was a lucky punch and, and uh, the distributor sits on the longer end. But when you go to the big boys and start to compete with them, like Netflix or like Apple or whatever, it's a completely different game. So maybe our view of thinking, I have my own view, obviously, but you can share your view. <laughs> our view of thinking, on, on two examples, maybe Martin, what about Apple's payment solution? Why do we going to succeed versus them on the, on the mobile banking side? Yes. Um, I think we are succeeding in our market in, in, in the markets where we're offering payment solutions. I think um, for Apple to uh, do this move now was a brilliant move. I mean, NFC has been there for a long time. Um, credit card integration um, is something they they could have done a while ago. Um, uh, it's um, you know it's big on Android. What, why didn't they do it before? Well, they were waiting for distribution, um, and uh, now they're switching the system, and it's the perfect thing to do. It's a very convenient, easy solution for the consumer and I personally uh, am uh, convinced it's going to be a, a, a rocket success. Um, now how do credit cards work in, um, uh, in, in, in our markets? Well let me take on, on MFS, let me look at Africa first. Um, there aren't any cards um, so there's nothing to integrate. Um, second account integration, well 95% of consumers don't have a bank account. Um, what it is, is Africa is one gigantic, big, cash-based economy. And what you need to do is you need to come up with consumer services. We're now in the, in the B2C space. You need to come up with financial services that make sense to the consumer that there is now. Um, now, this means you need to have a very broad and dense distribution network where people can take their cash and actually pay it into a mobile wallet. You need to create elements of payment where they can actually use it. Um, and you then eventually need to interlink with other services so you create this ecosystem where you can make it spin around. Eventually what we will be doing is we will be integrated with credit cards as well. Um, for example, in Tanzania we just started integrating with banks uh, in Rwanda. Uh, we now have integrated with half the banks that are in the country um, and we have been the first operator worldwide to actually do interoperability between different mobile operators. So what we're doing there is we're creating a new financial ecosystem. Now the question is will the big guys eat that market? Well, one of the credit card companies went into one of our African markets and said, we're going to take that one by storm. They tried for a year and a half, and after they actually had 1% market share, um, they actually eventually left that market. I'm not going to say which one it is. Um, so it's not easy to crack the African model. Um, and I think in some of the markets, we've cracked the model pretty well, and we're growing 40 50 60% year on year. I think the other advantage, of course, is which uh, Victor can answer probably when it comes to Latin America, a does this model prevail in Latin America as well? Plus, the relationship with the consumer we have when it comes to the counter context, paying in the money, taking out the money, and the kind of stickiness around the ecosystem you create. Maybe you want to say something? Yeah, absolutely. In Latin America, as uh, Martin pointed out, is even though we have two sides uh, to the system, there are some credit cards in, in Latin America. But it's not the case as more developed markets where they're really pervasive and really penetrating the market. So in Latin America, we still have a huge opportunity also for the underserved, if you will. And what we have seen, and, and, and as Martin said, we've been cracking the model. It's, even though it's been slower, as you pointed out earlier today, in terms of what we anticipated, but we do see penetration rates go of our services. And it's mainly as we start to create the ecosystem around what we're offering. So, for instance, in, in our Central American markets, users can now pay the utility bills, as Mario pointed out, with MFS. And probably one of the aspects to highlight is the integration we also have with our own services. As we deployed DTH uh, just you know, a few months ago, 
we start to see that 40% of the prepaid subscribers who are buying DTH are choosing Tigo because they can actually pay with MFS services. So it's the combination of how we integrate not only the payment platform, the, the fact that we know the consumer, we have the distribution network that they have access to all the different points where they can actually go and cash in money into a mobile uh, financial services account and actually make use of that account to pay other services that is really creating the differentiation that we have in the market. And that's why it, it's, it is a going concern and a very relative strong business model for our Latin American markets.